oftentimes Satan knows exactly what it takes to distract you from the goodness of God. Some of us are better children of God when we're alone. Paul's got satisfied in Laban's house. But you know, when you've got stuff unresolved in your history, you can't focus on your destiny. Because in the back of your mind, you're still wondering, I wonder if Esau's still trying to kill me. Some of you, before you go to your next level, before you go up, your next level is going to be back being down so he can bring you through and raise you up higher than you really were. Some of our problem is we got substitutes for changing. Come on. Dress up instead of changing. Talk differently instead of changing. Act differently instead of changing. Say, neighbor. That's what freedom feels like. I, I may have some more chains he's gonna break, but I first wanna thank God for the chains he's already broken. Thank you, Lord. With those hands joined and lifted, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your presence. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Father, I ask for even more liberty now because we ask for even more of the Holy Spirit to come in this room today. Father, we ask you to come and however it is you desire to move, we ask you to have your way. We place no restrictions, no limitations on your movement. We say have your way. God, even today, I thank you that you break the power of shame, that you break the power of guilt, that you break the power of intimidation, that you break the power of harassment, that you break the power of torture, you break the power of secrets, you break the power of darkness, you break the power of shame, sin, iniquity, transgression, by the power of your blood, Father, enter this room and encounter us today. Enter this space and have your way today. Leave our minds changed. Leave our lives changed. Let our destinies be altered. Invade these next few moments with divine oracles. God, speak in this house. Shake everything that can be shaken. Move everything that can be moved. Turn right side up and upside down. God, have your way. God, I surrender spirit, my mind, my body to you. The oracles of God come through lips of clay. Breathe upon my cognitive faculties. Cause me to think your thoughts and speak your words. Lord, most of all, I pray that you'll be glorified. When we leave here, we'll be more in love with you than when we came. In the powerful name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Everybody shout amen. Amen. While you're standing, go very quickly to the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, first Sunday of the year, first book of the Bible. We are in our Turning Point series. Before it's all said and done, I'm going to give you, through this series, seven main points, your turning points, that will alter the trajectory of your life, take you to where God wants you to be in 2019. Look at your neighbor and say, this is my year of change. Year of change. Say, don't get mad at me if I change. Yeah. I intended to change this year. Yeah. Say, I will, take I will take every accusation, every accusation. That, I'm differently that I'm acting differently as a compliment. Yeah. So if you say you're acting different, I'm going to take it as a compliment because I intend to be different this year. I intend to be better. Genesis chapter number 32, verse number 24, very familiar passage of scripture. Our first point that we preached on New Year's Eve was the point of decision. That change begins with a choice. That if you, the decision doesn't happen when you just make up your mind. The decision happens when you make a move. And God said this year, if you'll make the move, I'll make the noise. Isn't that good news? Genesis chapter number 32, verse number 24 says something like this. Then Jacob was left alone.
and there a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day I want you to just politely look at your neighbor nudge them and say neighbor I just need to be alone you may be seated in the presence of the Lord I just I just need to be I just need to be alone you ever have seasons in your life you just say I don't mean no harm I just need to be alone right now I just need to be alone it was C.S. Lewis who was the mastermind of the lion the witch in the wardrobe who made a startling statement he said one of the greatest problems of man is not God's ability to provide but is that we are far too easily pleased it was John Piper a great theologian who made the statement God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him let me say that again that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him C.S. Lewis says the problem then with our satisfaction is we are far too easily satisfied Historically, man has the tendency to be drawn away and distracted from their destiny as a result of their resources and their relationships. Nothing oftentimes distracts us like stuff and people. Uh, in the garden before God gave man anything, he gave man himself. It is not until man gets a garden and gets a girl that man forgets his God. I feel like preaching already. Isn't it something that when we start to feel our own gifts and we start to observe our own garden and we get our own girls or guys, we get distracted from our God. Nothing disrupts your theology like your sociology. <laughs> you got a good relationship with God until the right folk enter into your life. And what I have found is oftentimes Satan knows exactly what it takes to distract you from the goodness of God. Some of us are better children of God when we're lonely. Some of us make poor worshipers when we find who we call the one. Because the moment we find Bay Boo Boaz, we forget about the one who blessed our soul. I feel like shouting right now. It's just interesting how stuff has a way of making you stop your pursuit because you started off in pursuit of God's presence and God's person and God's power and God's purpose. But instead of presence, now you got presents. You got stuff. And when you got stuff, it was enough to satisfy you and to stop you from your desperation for God. Remember how you cried out to God when you did not know how you were going to pay the rent? You remember how you cried out to God when you didn't know how you were going to finish school? You remember how desperate you were for God when you didn't know if anybody would ever think you were marriage material? You remember how desperate you were for God when you depended on him for everything? But now all of a sudden you have options and options are another word for temptations. And the temptations have now drawn you away from the God who used to be your only option and now you don't worship God for who he is you only praise him for what he's done and it's always predicated on what he's done for you lately and if you look at a present day and it doesn't look as good as a former day then you don't give God the praise he's worthy of but is there anybody here that said stuff will never replace my savior St uh, God stuff will never take the place of the one who reached down into nothing with nothing and changed my everything I wish you looked at your neighbor said neighbor I just need to be alone again it's interesting how how things and, and and stuff we get will distract our vision and blur our vision of God and our understanding of our necessity one of our greatest problem is we we think we want God we don't realize we need God When I realize I need God, I treat God differently. But if I just think I want him, if the demands of having him are too great, I will turn down the demands because I really don't want him the way I said I did. And the problem is I don't know how badly I need him. 
And so what happens is when you have great purpose, great potential, God wants to do something great in your life. Satan will oftentimes send you substitutes and counterfeits. It's not that God didn't want you to be blessed and to have things. It's just he didn't want the things to have you. And so oftentimes we stop short of destiny once we get a certain amount of things. But when there's really something God has put inside of you, a divine desire is never satisfied by stuff. I, I came in the priest. In our text, there's a man named Jacob who is left alone. Jacob is alone now. He's alone. His, his, he's, he's finally alone. He wasn't even alone in the womb because he had a twin brother by the name of Esau. And the problem with Jacob that I believe is that Jacob wrestles with the pressure of potential. Go with me today. I feel the Holy Ghost. Have you ever wrestled with the pressure of your potential? Is anybody here say my greatest pressure really isn't my past at this point. My greatest pressure is what I'm supposed to be. I'm wrestling with dying short of what I could be. My, 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 my problem at this point is I don't want to die short of what I was supposed to do. Uh, somebody here has learned how to get over what you did, but I'm still concerned about the stuff I'm supposed to do that I have not done yet. And, and it's the pressure of potential. Here is the problem that Jacob has while he's in the womb. He and his brother are wrestling in the womb. And God says about them while they're in the womb, two nations are in your womb. Can you imagine the pressure of you are still an embryo in the womb and God has already spoken the future? that nations are coming out of you like, like you are supposed to be something you're supposed to do something and a matter of fact the prophecy goes on to say your older brother is going to serve you and so I believe he has a divine calling on his life. He is born with an awareness that I'm supposed to be great. I'm supposed to lead. The only problem is he is born trying to do it in his own strength. See, some of your problem is some of the greatest people in the world that we would acknowledge in man's eyes of greatness are people who are successful in wrong assignments. That's some of the mess they got into. Watch this. The reason they built a drug empire was they were destined to build a financial economic empire that would bring their family out of stuff. And so they got a gift, but the gift has been perverted and used in the wrong direction. I wish I had somebody preach in the room. And so what happens is when you know your calling, but you don't know how to get to it, you fight in your own strength. Oh God, you feel like you got to prove what you are rather than become what you are and so anybody who gets in your way you trip them up because you don't know when it's God's promise you have to take God's path look at your neighbor and say you're going to have to take God's path so, so while he's in the womb he's on his way out his brother's about to get out before him he grabs his heel it's sad when you think other folks got to fall for you to rise it's just, it's just. Some of you can't celebrate anybody else's success because you believe their success is your failure. But here's what you got to realize that just because they came out before you don't mean you ain't coming out. Look at your neighbor and say, I really ain't concerned with which one of us get out first. I just want both of us to get out. I may not be the first one in the family to go to college, but I am going to college. Y'all don't hear me here. I may, come on, I may not be the first one to make it in marriage, but I'm going to be one of the ones who make it in marriage. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I may not be the first one, but I'm going to be a part of the ones. I may not be the first one to love God and serve God, but I will be one of the ones. And I don't have to trip you up for me to walk in my destiny. So it is because he feels like he's got to do it in his own strength. He tricks his brother out of his birthright. His brother doesn't understand the value of what he has, so he exchanges it for a bowl of beans. And then when his father's getting old, his mother sets him up and tells Jacob, hey, dress up like your brother. Dress up like your brother, and while your, your father's old, he don't see like he used to see. Right? You go in and steal the blessing because there's power in your father's blessing. So he has a birthright he tricked his brother to get. He's got a blessing he tricked his father to get. 
he is trying to fulfill God's plan in his strength so now he's on the run because his brother's ready to kill him because you already got my birthright you could have left the blessing alone here is a man with a divine calling who's got some dysfunctional behavior oh God and before you turn your nose up at Jacob you need to find a mirror and say I got a, a for sure calling but I got some carnality that I'm wrestling with y'all do okay let me say it this way I got a divine calling but I got some personal dysfunctions y'all look at you just look straight your neighbor won't know I'm talking to you because your neighbor is sitting there thinking you need to raise your hand and say something with your bad attitude he is he it's crazy because his mother has taught him that he can't get his calling in his clothes god i feel something here his, his 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 mother has in turn taught him that you will never become your best being yourself so so he has now dressed up like his brother and what do you do when you got somebody else's blessing and it never rested on you because you were never you if nothing else this is the year to be yourself oh god oh god Oh God, if you're going to be my friend, be my friend. You ain't going to be who you think I am, friend. You're going to be my friend. You at least going to know who you're dealing with. I want to be authentic about who I am. I ain't got to be perfect, but I'm going to be authentic. I'm going to allow God to work on me. And I'm going to allow God to use my gifts and allow God to breathe on the personality he gave me. I'm not going to be walking around trying to act like you, expecting God to give you, give me what he promised me while I'm acting like you. God, this year, let me learn who you made me to be because that's who you made the promise to. He didn't give your promise to Esau, so then you can't get your promise dressed up like him. Got to hurry, gotta hurry, gotta hurry. So his, his, his brother wants to kill him, so his mother says, now you got to run. Now, now you got to run because if you don't depart, you're going to die. Oh God, I ain't got time to preach that. Some stuff you had to get away from or you would have died in it. Some of you better be glad you went to college when you did. Because if you'd have hung around, you'd have done some. Y'all quiet in this church. Look at them acting like. What's this, what's this, what's this? So she says, sometimes God, you were wrong, but he hid you. He didn't let you die in what you deserved. You did some stuff, you deserved whatever outcome perhaps would have come your way, but God hid you for a season while he worked on you and got your heart right. Some stuff he lets you get away from, you didn't get away with it, but he got you away from it so he could get it out of you. So, so watch this. He goes to his uncle Laban's house. He goes to Laban's house. While he's in Laban's house, he sees girl he falls in love with he works seven years in his own strength for what he wants when he gets it on, on day after the wedding he wakes up he says whoa this ain't what I worked for he looked at that girl and couldn't tell whether or not she was looking back at him and he said he said I know I ain't marry you. <laughs> you <see? laughs> hey! <laughs> she was tender-eyed. <laughs> I'm just saying. Huh? So... So he said, all right, I'll work seven more years to get the girl I wanted. His own strength. He's willing to work. Get it. Watch this. While he's there, while he's there, 
his uncle cheats him out of his wages. But he learns that when God's hand is on you, God will provide. So what God told him to do was he said, take the cattle that you have down here and let them see this little piece of wood that is polka dot and speckled and the calves as they're eating while they're looking at the speckle when they start to mate they'll reproduce what they were looking at some of your problem is you keep reproducing what you're focused on you keep focusing on Facebook drama so you re you reproduce it you're He ends up doing better than his uncle did. And all of a sudden, God shows up to him and God says, now it's time for you to return to the place of your kindred. What he knows is, that means it's time for destiny. My destiny is about to be fulfilled. And as excited as he is about destiny, he understands that destiny demands that I deal with dysfunction I left behind. Because some of you, to get to your future, you got to face your past. Because not only is there land waiting, there's a man waiting. You've got to get to your promise, but you're going to have to go back to a person. That person you did wrong, that person you manipulated, that person you never apologized to, that person you never got it right with, and as excited as he is about destiny, he is nervous about dealing with Esau. You ever been excited about your potential and nervous about your past? Oh, y'all so quiet. Because here's the deal. Perhaps he had almost gotten satisfied in Laban's house. But you know, when you've got stuff unresolved in your history, you can't focus on your destiny. Because in the back of your mind, you're still wondering, I wonder if Esau's still trying to kill me. Oh God, it's dangerous to live at a place where you're scared to go back because you didn't get stuff right before you left. I'm preaching better than you're shouting. Let me tell you something. Some of you, before you go to your next level, before you go up, your next level is going to be back being down so he can bring you through and raise you up higher than you really were. I'm preaching to somebody in this house. There are some things you're going to have to face it if you're going to... Get your future. So he's getting ready. He's getting ready. He's getting ready to go back home. And he says, I don't know. I've been around here keeping cattle. Esau been killing folks. And if I go back and I face Esau like this, it's over. He says, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take all my stuff and I'm going to send two whole loads of stuff ahead of me and give it to him as a gift hopefully the gift will satisfy him but how many know that some stuff you can't pay your way out of because I would imagine Esau would say I don't want your stuff I got stuff I want to know have you changed oh God some people don't want stuff they want a sorry I'm sorry I'm, I'm. so he says he says oh the gifts ahead and here he is can you imagine he is with everybody else and perhaps probably maybe even his wives don't know what he's dealing with even all of his servants have no idea about Esau so he's got a crowd of folks around him, but he's really alone much like you because your friends know the stuff you advertise but they don't know the stuff you won't talk about Because, you know, it's some folk you love, but you don't love them enough to tell them all that. Here, here he is. Here he is. 
and he's got a choice to make. He really doesn't have to go back. He can stop. He's got stuff. He's got wives. He's got servants. He's got children. Go find your own land and just build there. You don't have to deal with Esau. But destiny is placing a demand on him. And he passes over. I feel like shouting. I ain't got long enough to shout, but I feel like it. He passes by the Fort Jabbok. And he sends his wife and his servants and his cattle and his children ahead of him across this little stream place where two streams come together. And he says, if I am going to face my future, I got to face it empty. Jabbok in the Hebrew means the place of pouring out. Some of us can't get new success because we won't pour out old success. He sends ahead his relationships and his resources because he knows this will not substitute him changing. God help me today. Some of our problem is we got substitutes for changing. You dress up instead of changing. Talk differently instead of changing. Act differently instead of changing. Pop up who you know instead of changing. But your future is not waiting on who you pretend to be. Your future is waiting on who you're supposed to be. He makes a decision. I will not let my resources cause me to be satisfied and stop short of destiny. So I'm sending this money away. Status, you can have it. Stuff, you can have it. Leave me alone. 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 You ever been home alone? When it was dark and your house make noises. But you ain't. That's how some of our lives are. We don't like to be alone because our life makes noises. And we have to deal with certain stuff in the dark areas of our own lives. When everybody else has walked away, you hear the noise of your mistakes, the noise of your own issues. When you get alone by yourself, some of us, our problem is we're afraid to be alone in the dark. He empties himself and separates himself intentionally didn't happen accidentally he intentionally got alone not isolation separation I'm catching up just let me stay behind to deal with some stuff it is alone it is alone where he says I love you he hugged Rachel kissed his baby sent him ahead he said I love y'all Hopefully, I'll be a better daddy tomorrow. Because right now, I need to be alone to do business with God. Hey, God. When man is empty and alone, God appears. I'm going to say that again. When man is both empty and alone, God will come. <laughs> when man is not full of himself and full of his stuff and full of his own opinion and full of his own will, God will show up to an empty man in a place of solitude and begin to deal with the man. What will God do when he finds a man alone? First thing he will do is wrestle. And there a man wrestled with him. That doesn't mean much unless you know what wrestle means. Wrestle there in the Hebrew means to cause to vanish, to beat into thin air. 
God says, when I get alone with you, I beat you into thin air. You say, now, Bishop, that's why I don't pray. I told y'all every time I get with God, he beat me. Now, what happens is that old you, that self-serving will of yours, when you get alone, he beats it away. Uh, those desires, he beats them away. That thought process, he beats it away. Those habits, he beats them away. When you get alone, he starts beating you to thin air. He says, Jacob, if I'm going to help you, I got to break you. You're going to have to decrease if I'm going to increase. What I believe what kept Jesus humble was even after he would do great things, he would go get alone. Because the lack of humility is the greatest indication of the lack of intimacy. Because when you've really been with God, it's hard to get puffed up in you. Because when you get along with God, you start saying something like, woe is me, for I am undone. Y'all don't hear me here. When you really been with God, you say something like, Paul, I am the least of the saints. I am the chief of sinners. I'm not worthy of what he's doing in my life. Is there anybody here that says, walk on me, God, wrestle with me until this false image is nothing? I gotta hurry. I gotta hurry. Number one. He wrestles with him. Number two, when a man gets alone with God, he watches him. God, when he saw that he did not prevail against him, God watches how you respond when he wrestles. He says, man, I'm breaking him. And they still worship him. I'm correcting stuff. And she's still telling me thank you. I'm getting some stuff right in them. And they won't stop serving God. When he saw that he did not prevail. He said I'm watching your persistence. I'm watching your passion. I noticed that no matter how I walk on you. You won't walk away from me. Look at your neighbor and say I don't care what God does. It may be painful. But I'm going to stay with God. He wrestled with him. He watched him, and when he saw that he didn't prevail, third thing he did was he touched him. Because Brian, when you get along with God, he'll touch you. I love encountering God's presence here at church. But I'm going to tell you what's really powerful. When God touches you at home. When all of a sudden you break out in a worship and there was nobody leading a song. And all of a sudden tears start streaming down your face, man. And you're like, man, God's been good to me. Yeah, hey, 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 hey. I may not have everything I asked for, but I got more than I deserve. And a gratitude begins to spring up out of your soul. You see, this next turning point is the turning point of encountering God. It's when God touches you. That stuff starts changing in your life. You remember when you were sitting on the couch saying, God, how is this business ever going to work? How am I going to become the man you want me to be? And then God shows up in the room and you open your Bible and it turns to a page that became the turning point of your life. That's when things start changing. When God touches you. He touched him. Two and a half minutes. He touched him. He touched him. Watch where he touched him. In the socket of his hip. He, he knocked the prop. Some of you need God to knock away 
your prop. What's been propping you up? See, all your life you've been able to depend on your power and your ability, and it's made you proud. So he has to hit you in the prop to remove your pride. So you'll now rely on his power because you can't fulfill his purpose in your power. Knock the prop. Hit him in the hollow of his thigh and knocked it out of joint. And God refused to heal it. What do you do when God hurts you and won't heal it? God, they broke my heart. And God says, yep. What do you do when he calls you into destiny but won't fix your limp? Because God said, I ain't going to have you strutting like you did it in your strength. I'm going to have you limping so I can keep you leaning. I'm going to lead you in there limping. <laughs> because your neighbors, I've been through some stuff. And I've shed it some tears. But I'm headed to my future. I may have to limp. But the limp is an indication that I've been with God. And God wants to make sure that his grace is made perfect in my weakness. Look at your neighbor say, you might be limping, but don't stop leaning. You say, God, I need them to take it off my record so you can bless me. God said, nope, I'm going to leave it on your record and I'm going to bless you anyway. I need you to remove the bankruptcy from my past. God said, nope, I'm going to leave the bankruptcy there and still bless you to prove that when I open up the window, Nobody can stop it. Somebody shout, touch me, Lord. Touch me, God. Touch me with your power. Touch me with your strength. Because before you can have the strength of God, you have to recognize the weakness of yourself. And it's not to you say, God, I can't do it without you. Can't leave this family without you. Can't run this business without you. Can't live my purpose without you. I need you. Listen, listen, listen. He wrestled. He watched him. He touched him. He talked to him. Because when you get alone, I'm done, I'm done. He'll talk to you. He said, let me challenge your desperation. Let me go for the day breaks. Let me tell you something. God will always give you an opportunity to give up. Y'all didn't hear what I just said. Y'all hear me? God will always give you an opportunity to give up. He, if you choose to walk away from his plan, he'll let you. And he normally, when you're the closest to the performance of God in your life, God will say, you sure you still want this? Elijah looked at Elisha and said, stay here. Elisha said, the devil is a lie. Wherever you go, I'm going. I know I'm close. Jesus turned around to his disciples. He said, do y'all want to leave me also? They said, absolutely not. You got the words of eternal life. Ain't going nowhere. Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane said, Lord, can the cup pass? He said, nevertheless, not my will. God will give you the opportunity to give up. 
but if you give up you miss the opportunity to go up he said he said he said let me go for the day breaks he said I won't let you go unless you bless me here's what happened the word blessing had been redefined in his life why didn't he say when he said I won't let you go unless you bless me he wasn't asking for stuff he had stuff he had sent that away see sometimes in your life God will take you through enough stuff to where you redefine blessing you want a status and stuff and folks God will let you go through enough stuff and say God I ain't no good for the stuff or the folks if I don't have you Some of y'all need to separate yourself from your stuff for a moment. I say, God, where are you? Because a nice house absent of his presence ain't enough. A nice car without God as a passenger ain't enough. So I won't let you go unless you bless me. I ain't letting you go till you bless me. So he said, what's your name? He said, my name's Jacob. He says, not anymore. I'm going to call you Israel. Because now you're a prince with God because you've wrestled with God and man and you prevailed. You actually won this fight because you were willing to lose it. You finally got out of your own strength and started relying on me. He changed his name but Derek he still didn't let go because the touch wasn't a blessing the change of his name wasn't even the blessing he turned around and said now who are you and the Bible said and he blessed him there so the blessing wasn't the touch and the blessing wasn't the, even the change blessing was his presence the second turning point that would change everything in your life this year is time alone in God's presence because it's there that he's going to bless you with himself how many want that change this year come on lift those hands and begin to worship God I want that change God I want to be alone with you he wrestled with him. He saw him. He watched him. He touched him. He spoke to him. God's going to speak to you when you get by yourself this year. And then he's going to bless you when you get by yourself this year. I just need to be alone. Come on, it's good to fellowship with people. You need great relationships. But don't let that be a substitute for your relationship with God. I need to be alone right now. Because somebody say, I have spent my whole life defining myself by who and what was around me. Now I'm ready to define myself by my relationship with God. Before Adam had anything, he had God. Don't gain the world and lose God. Oh God, I still want to walk with you. <laughs> God, I still want to talk with you. God, I still need you to whisper to me. And every now and then, I need you to touch me. And when I get back into the old me, I need you to change me and remind me of who I really am. I need to be alone. Somebody say, I need to be alone with God. If that's you today and you're giving your life to the Lord or surrendering your life to the Lord, be giving your life to Jesus for the first time, recommitting your life to the Lord or joining this local church. When I count to three, raise your hand. I'm going to pray for everybody in just a moment, but I want to deal specifically if you're giving your life to the Lord for the first time or rededicating your life to the Lord or joining this local church. If that's you, I want you to...